Good afternoon and wel welcome to the Wilson Center and in particular welcome to our colleagues from the uh, Resilience Academy. We have a number of colleagues with us who have joined us from all over the world in a culmination of a five-year effort uh, supported by the Munich Ray Foundation in collaboration with partners from the International Center for Climate Change and Development out of Bangladesh and the United Nations University. So we're meeting um, to launch what we are calling Resilience Week here at, at the Wilson Center. And I know many of you are familiar with the Wilson Center. We serve as a living memorial to President Wilson, established by Congress, and most recently recognized by the University of Pennsylvania as the number one think tank globally for transdisciplinary research. And I think this is important because when we look at this idea and this concept of resilience and resiliency, it really does cross many disciplines. And I'm, I'm quite pleased that today in our conversation, we will be chatting with Alice Hill, who uh, will be talking to us about resiliency in the face of uncertainty. I know many of you are familiar with Alice. She is currently a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, where she focuses on building resilience to destabilizing catastrophes catastrophic events, including the impacts of climate change. Uh, prior to uh, serving at Hoover, she served as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Resilience Policy for the National Security Council. While at the White House, she led the development of national policy regarding national security and climate change, the incorporation of climate resilience considerations into international development, federal efforts in the Arctic, building national capabilities for long-term drought resilience, and the establishment of national risk management standards for three of the most damaging natural hazards. So quite an impressive uh, record, and I think it's a very unique opportunity for us to have someone who has been in the trenches of policymaking on these issues to, to share her perspective about how we continue to, to share and engage on resiliency when we know that there's a certain degree of uncertainty around these events. So Alice, a, a very warm welcome. I hope you consider this your second home. We're delighted to have you here and I hand it over to you. Well, I really am delighted to have a chance to meet with you today to talk about an issue that I know many in this room are passionate about, as am I, resilience. The Merriam-Webster English Language Dictionary traces the first use of the word resilience to 1807. But if you go on Google and look at the history of the use of the word, you'll see that in the 1970s, it just took off and has been exploding ever since. In August of last year, the dictionary chose the word resilience as its word of the day to reflect the increased usage of resilience. I tend to think that the reason we're seeing the explosion of the word resilience is because uh, that phenomenon mirrors the growing complexity we are experiencing in an inter connected world. Resilience is proving necessary to withstand the disruptions to our very interconnected systems. Your capstone event uh, focuses on research to action. And frankly, in my work in the resilience area, that is the area that is most in need of focus. We have some fantastic scientific research, but we need to learn how to apply it so that we can help communities engage on the very important work of making themselves safe, particularly in the face of future risk. Now, I hadn't really thought much about resilience until I joined the Obama administration in 2009. At that time, I joined the Department of Homeland Security. President Obama had given or issued the first of his executive orders requiring each of the federal agencies to engage in adaptation planning for climate change. 
I don't know uh, how many of you have worked in bureaucracies, but if you're the newcomer, uh, it has been my observation that sometimes when there's a new assignment that others aren't particularly interested in, they look around the room, see who is new, and say, oh, give it to that person, which is, in fact, how I ended up working on climate adaptation. But that opportunity gave me what I have come to view as my aha moment, the moment when you've had a chance to think deeply about the risks posed uh, by our interconnectedness as well as the risks posed by a warming globe. When you begin to understand how catastrophic those risks can be absent some preparation or building of resilience. It's a little bit of like that moment explained in chaos theory where a butterfly flaps its wings in Indonesia and then through a series of atmospheric changes, there's a tornado in Texas. With climate change, you begin to understand that it affects virtually everything regarding human society and civilization. It, it affects our energy sources, our food sources, and our water sources. It will touch not only every corner of the United States, but also every corner of the globe. Now, we know that by necessity, humans will adapt, but we need to figure out ways to best prepare us for that long, hard effort at adaptation. When I got that first assignment at DHS, we assembled a task force, and we asked in 2009 the very basic question. Should, it, should an agency like the Department of Homeland Security, which was founded after the terrorist events in 9-11, but contains our emergency management, FEMA, our Coast Guard, our immigration services, the Secret Service that guards the president, responsibility for critical infrastructure? Should that agency care about climate change now? Our task force studied the issue and concluded that we should care deeply about climate change now. Our National Oceanic Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, recently calculated that since 1980, the U.S. has sustained 212 so-called billion-dollar disasters. That's where we suffer losses of greater than billion, $1 billion uh, from a single event. The total cost of these events to the United States has been $1.2 trillion. Now, 2017 has been a particularly tough year for the United States so far. We've already, up till this month, but not including the wildfires that have burned 10 miles uh, worth of land in California, not including those, we've already had 15 $1 billion events right here in the United States. That includes historic droughts, wildfires in other areas of the country, and the hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. Now, those of you in this room know it's not just the United States that has suffered devastating losses this year. If you look to South Asia, Bangladesh, Nepal, and India, they've all had deadly flooding. Sierra Leone in Africa has suffered deadly flooding. 40 million people in South Asia have already been affected by the floods. John Holdren was the former science advisor to the President of the United States. When he talked about climate change, he said we had three choices. We can mitigate, cut our emissions, we can adapt, or we can suffer. This year, we've had a great deal of suffering. We need to pay greater attention to both the mitigation 
and the adopt adaptation. And we're still not through 2017. With this kind of loss, there's no wonder that our watchdogs here in the United States for the federal government, the Government Accountability Office, has said that climate change poses a high risk, a high fiscal risk, to the federal treasury here in the United States. That's extraordinary to me, given the economic strength of the United States. Climate change will in all likelihood remain on the high-risk list for our government accountability office going forward. The United States is not ready yet for the impacts of climate change. And that's why it's so important that there are gatherings like this for us to learn from each other how we can better build resilience in the face of an uncertain future and in the face of future risk, we can no longer base our planning entirely on historic events. That will not keep us safe. We need to find ways to incorporate future risk in our designs, in our community planning, in our land use choices. Without doing so, we put ourselves at great risk for further suffering. Here in the United States, we are still working very hard on trying to figure this out, even in the, in the context of our national security. Not too far from here is an area called Hampton Roads in the state of Virginia. That area is one of our major military constellations in the United States. It's of huge strategic interest and national security interest to us here, here in America. There are some 30 military installations in that area. It has the largest naval port in the world. 20% of the US Navy fleet is home ported in the Hampton Roads area. But it also suffers from sea level rise at a more rapid rate than most areas along our coast in the United States, as well as subsidence. After I worked at DHS, on my very first day at the White House, I met with the city manager from Norfolk. Norfolk is one of the cities in the Hampton Roads area. Now that area, as I said, is suffering from sea level rise, and it suffers from nuisance flooding. That's where you just have flooding during an ordinary sunny day from tides. There's no storm involved. From 1960 to 2014, it saw the growth in that kind of flooding go from 1.6 days in 1960 to 7.3 days in 2014. In 2011, Norfolk decided to build a light rail system because many of the personnel that work on those military installations live off base. So it wanted to va provide a convenient way for military employees and personnel to get to their work. It aptly called this new light rail system the TIDE. So at this very first meeting on my first day in the White House, the city manager told me that they had constructed this light rail system at a cost of about $318 million. Many of those funds came from the federal government. He then added, its design did not account for sea level rise. He said, we already suffer from flooding. And he said he believed that the entire system was at risk of being washed away from coastal erosion. Unfortunately, in the course of my work at the White House, I've learned that Norfolk's experience is not the exception, rather it's the norm. Most of the infrastructure that's currently being constructed in the United States does not account for the future risk of either extreme heat, more flooding, higher winds, you name it. 
Our cost-benefit analysis shows, though, that if we put $1 in in advance of the event, we can save $4 on the back end. We are already seeing, as we've discussed, these billion-dollar events growing. We need to find a better way. It seems obvious that when we're building infrastructure that's designed to last 50 to 100 years, we would account for future risk. In fact, we can anticipate that some of the infrastructure will last well beyond 100 years. You may not appreciate it, but here in Washington, D.C., our drainage system running underneath the streets of Washington, D.C., much of it was laid in a civil war, which means it was laid in the 1860s. Kudos to the civil engineers uh, who built that system, but as we replace it, we need to find ways to make sure that it can handle the extreme precipitation that we are already and will surely experience going forward here in the United States. Ever more frequently, we are witnessing record-setting events causing infrastructure failure, or in the case of Puerto Rico's electric grid with Irma and then Maria, two hurricanes that hit it back to back, infrastructure destruction. The American Society of Civil Engineers is a professional group here in the United States. It gave our current infrastructure here in America the grade of D+. Plus. Not a good grade under our American grading system. And they gave it that grade for the state of our current infrastructure, its condition and its performance. That same society has said we need a new paradigm. We need a new approach to how we plan for the future risk posed by climate change. Using only historical events, events to inform our choices is putting us at distinct risk. We are vulnerable to unacceptable risks in, of failures in functionality, durability, and safety. Yet, as I've said, despite these risks, we do not yet here in the United States systematically incorporate future risks in our planning. For example, our plans for military construction and infrastructure do not yet fully account for the increased risks from storm, flooding, and sea level rise. Across the country, with just a few notable exceptions, such as New York City, when communities build their physical infrastructure, buildings, energy and communication facilities, urban water systems, transportation networks, and industrial facilities, they build it just to withstand what we've seen in the past. We use model building codes here in the United States. None of those yet reflect future risk from climate change. In short, we here in the United States has a, have a lot of preparedness work to do, and I hope through resilience academies like this, we can learn from those across the globe as we all confront a challenge that really none of us have ever been asked to plan for. We know that building codes work. In 1992, a terrible hurricane, a Category 5 hurricane, hit Florida. Hurricane Andrew caused massive de uh, devastation. 25,000 homes were destroyed. 100,000 were heavily damaged. The state of Florida essentially said, never again. They went and they created a new building code, which they issued in 2002, which had the highest wind standards of any building code in the United States. And then in 2004, they had four hurricanes, Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and Janine. When those hurricanes hit, they had the perfect test case, unfortunately, and they saw that the newly constructed buildings did far better in terms of withstanding the impacts of the storms than those that had been built earlier. We also are experiencing already risks to our infrastructure, our transportation system. 
The U.S. freight rail network is widely considered as one of the best rail networks in the world. It moves uh, a huge amount of freight here in the United States, and there are 140,000 miles in the system. And if you look at a map of the United States and where our, ra uh, our rail tracks are, you'll see that a lot of them on the East Coast follow along riverbeds. That was just an easy place to build. But with increased precipitation, we're discovering that those uh, railways are at increasing risk of being washed away as those rivers flood. And then as we experience greater heat events, we are discovering that we are at risk of sun kinks, or the simply the buckling of the railroad ties that can easily cause a derailment. In fact, this summer, San Francisco is normally foggy and cold in the summer. Uh, Mark Twain is famously stated, uh, quoted as saying, he spent, uh, the coldest winter he ever spent was the summer in San Francisco. But this summer, or in, late in September, there was a record heat event. It went to 106 degrees. So there, never having in, had to anticipate it, we had to slow our trains in the area to make sure that we avoided derailments. We've also, as many across the globe have, designed our airports for a different era, a cooler one. So we put our airports uh, along coasts and in river deltas to avoid mount mountains and take advantage of the flat land. But now, of course, those airports are at risk of flooding. We also laid asphalt and concrete, which we are discovering is at risk of bulk buckling. In 2012, right here in Washington, D.C., you may have flown into Reagan National Airport, an airplane got stuck in the tarmac. So we can't be resilient when our lifeline infrastructure can't function, and we're already seeing that infrastructure greatly stressed. We have to prioritize building resiliently, and we also have to prioritize understanding our interconnectedness. Superstorm Sandy was a wake-up call for the United States. That storm was so large that astronauts in the space station could see it. When it landed, it wasn't a hurricane, but it basically flooded lower Manhattan. We had anticipated there would be a storm surge of 12 feet. We hadn't accounted for the almost one foot of sea level rise that had already occurred. The storm surge came in at 14 feet. It went right over our barriers. It caused an electric substation to flood. And you may have seen the pictures of Lower Manhattan, our largest city in the United States, completely dark. There was only one building that was lit up during that time. It was the building of one of our investment banks, Goldman Sachs. They had done a lot of resilience work to make sure that that building was secure, including 20, putting 25 feet of sandbags around the building. The chief operating officer, Gary Cohn, who now sits in the White House, at the time was quoted as saying, you know, the building came through pretty well. Our, the only problem that we had was getting people to work. And in fact, if you look at the pictures, you can see the building is all lit, everything is dark around it, and there are cars floating in front of the building. So that was a wake-up call for us that we all need to understand that if one of our major lifeline infrastructure systems fails, such as electricity, there are cascading effects for our health system, dialysis patients lost uh, treatment, we had to evacuate 6,000 patients from high-rise facilities. And unfortunately, we are seeing that same story play out in Puerto Rico, where Puerto Rico lost its power system with massive impacts to the health care and really the safety of the community. 
we are at a crossroads. We are crossroads here in the United States, but really we're at a crossroads across the globe. The mayor of Charleston, South Carolina in, a, in the United States, a city which also suffers from unusually high sea level rise, put it bluntly when he said, we know this is coming. Shame on us if we don't get ready for it. Fortunately, once we decide to do something about it and get seriously engaged on resilience, I hope with your help and the help of your partners, we have a lot of great examples to turn to to help inform our work going forward. We can look at Kuala Lumpur, which built the smart tunnel, which floods during the time of extreme precipitation, but otherwise acts as a transportation corridor. We can more vigorously promote the use of green infrastructure. Lloyds of London has said that that's about 30 times cheaper uh, than building a seawall. We can more widely distribute solar power generators to avoid the kind of disruption that we've seen in Puerto Rico when your generators are entirely dependent on diesel fuel and it's difficult to get diesel fuel to the generators. Or we can look at what China's doing. Their experiment in turning 30 of their cities into giant sponges. Or Rotterdam that designed portions of its city to withstand flooding. There are lots of examples of leadership in this area. We need to bring together the collective wisdom so that we all may make wiser choices. The stakes for the American economy and the global economy, as well as p political stability, are very high. When I was young, there was an anthropologist who was a heroine of mine. Her name was Margaret Mead. Uh, she lived in Samoa for a number of years. She wrote a lot of books that garnered popular attention. She was also a keen observer of the world. Sometimes it's natural to feel this is all a bit overwhelming and quite daunting. But when I get in one of those moods, I remember something that Margaret Mead said. She said, never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. You are such a group. You're already, you are already engaged on this important mission. Your work on resilience will help you serve as the leaders we need as we try to find our path forward in this very difficult time. I'm truly honored to have a chance to speak with you. We all know we need to build resilience. The future of the globe depends on it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, that was sobering, inspirational. Um, I, I really liked that you had a number of very specific examples. Each time you said something, I had a question, and then you, you answered the question. <laughs> so you. you were very anticipatory um, in your comments. Thank you. I have a number of questions that I'd like to ask you, but I really would like to open it up to you. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. One of my colleagues will come to you. Please give your name and your affiliation. Once again, we're webcasting live. And get quickly to your question so we can get as many questions as possible. So we start with uh, Celine, and then we'll come to the front. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, I'm Salim al -Haq. I'm director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. Um, I'd like, it's, it's more of a comment than a question. I think one of the elements of building resilience is investing in human beings. And I want to give you the example of my country, Bangladesh, where, as you cited, we've had some major floods this year, and we have regular floods as well. But one of the things we don't have anymore 
is a major outbreak of cholera and diarrheal diseases following the flood. Immediately when the waters recede, the waters get contaminated, and we used to get major spikes, and, and in fact, many deaths from cholera and, and diarrhea. We don't get that anymore. And that's because people know what to do. They will wade through chest deep water to get clean drinking water and make sure that they're drinking clean water, and that's education. That's people knowing how to resist and to build their resilience. So investing in people, to me, is one of the major elements, not just technology and, and building designs, but human beings. Thank you. Thank you. I think, um, after, oh, yes. Thank you for this inspiring speech. My name is Thomas Losser from Unigree Foundation. You were talking about Sandy and uh, how it paralyzed uh, people in the US and then Matthew came last year. And so, but uh, as living in Europe, we get different news about reallocation of research funds, one on climate change, the other on resilience building. And of course, news sometimes mix it up. So could you please outline uh, how the research is being organized to build up resilience for these kinds of events, hurricanes and floods along the coasts? Okay. Well, oh, you want And uh, let's take one more yeah, question. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, please, Amando, right there. Uh, thank you, Frank Tomala from SEI, Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, I want to follow up on Salim's comments about investment. Um, I think if we understand what resilience means, um, there are certain principles that we can apply. So for example, um, taking a systems approach to understand the interlinkages between systems, um, building in redundancy and flexibility. But this goes against our current systems that are driven by growth, profits, and um, efficiency. So I would be interested to get your perspective, Alice, on <coughs> how we can overcome these challenges and changing the mindset of the people in power to make these investments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. So Alice, I think we have some you know, critical points here. You know, to what degree can we invest in education and raising awareness, and how does that link in to the other other types of response and resilience building mechanisms that you talk to? Um, how can we better organize research so that is, is is taken up by policy that really helps build resilience? And this question that Frank is raising about profits and efficiency to me also raises this question of short-term interest versus long-term resiliency building. So. Some, some critical considerations. I also wanted to add a question. I was quite struck that when you spoke, you mentioned that you had this aha moment. Um, and I remember I was in Bangladesh with Salim when um, um, Superstorm Sandy occurred, and my Bangladeshi colleague said to me, you know, you Americans, we have Superstorm Sandys all the time. You know, so they, at, on the one hand, they are saying, well, we, this is our new norm. This is our new reality. We have found ways to deal with it. But at the same time, they were also saying to me, stop calling us resilient. Um, you know, the degree to which you use resiliency as a label to put on communities so that policymakers don't take the action that they should take. So there is resiliency is not always perceived as positive by these communities who are at the front line. So talk a little bit about that because it's a complicated space and word to use, even if the dictionary is recognizing it as the word of the day. <laughs> right. So uh, I think there is a theme here uh, that uh, certainly um, humans are at the center of all this. Of course, we're usually contributing to the problem uh, through our emissions. But the longer I work in this field, uh, the, the more I realize it's about um, human and our ability to pro make proper risk assessments. Uh, so I think training and education is critical. Uh, I have had uh, a experience more directly. Uh, we've had more a success in another area that I have, which is about resilience. And that is uh, resilience when you have a catastrophic event like a bombing or a shooting. Unfortunately, we've seen a number of those here. And we have been able to take some of the learning that we have on uh, 
stopping hemorrhagic bleeding uh, by you need to take immediate action to stop somebody who's, for example, had a, a deep wound uh, from bleeding out and dying. And we've actually seen that that kind of education is saving lives and also our military are bringing that home. So I know that this can work. I'm very excited to learn that uh, you've reduced the risk of cholera. Uh, here in the United States, I don't think we are um, as familiar with some of the risks that are posed by these events. We've had reports from Houston of people uh, walking through floodwaters and suffering great infections as a result. So we need to do a better job, and it is ultimately uh, helping people evaluate the risk of uh, flooded waters or what it may be. Uh, there was another uh, question about research funds. Uh, this is a difficult question at the moment. Um, the reason for that is that uh, our current administration in the United States uh, has indicated that they believe that uh, it's unclear what the belief is as to whether um, we are suffering an accelerating rate of climate change. Um, and so uh, to some extent, uh, I'm told that in some agencies uh, that certainly terming something as climate change or climate resilience work is not a successful strategy uh, for attracting future dollars or uh, for even handing out research funds. Uh, it's a bit opaque. It's not immediately obvious uh, what exactly is occurring, but I do not anticipate we'll see um, an increased level of research interest in this. Uh, we do know that we need a co better cost-benefit analysis than the one I referred to. That work was underway before the Obama administration change to the Trump administration. I'm hoping that continues because uh, this leads to the next uh, point uh, where we had a question about uh, how we deal uh, with this in terms of our economy and that we want short-term returns. I think if we have greater uh, understanding about what that modest investment early on can save you uh, later on, and that includes in business continuity, for example, for a business, that they'll be up and running faster. Uh, the plans for their uh, employees to be able to work remotely, um, better uh, business continuity um, efforts overall, we will be more resilient. In the coming years, I anticipate there'll be more resilience efforts, truthfully, coming from state and local, not the federal government in the United States as well as through the private sector. We're beginning to see uh, greater engagement from our, uh, from some major uh, investors and other financial companies indicating that they want to uh, include consideration of climate risk and evaluation of their investments. After Puerto Rico, we saw that we had a shortage of saline bags. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry was affected because we had a high concentration of uh, pharmaceutical companies in Puerto Rico. We saw that after uh, the similar effects after the 2011 flooding in Thailand, where we lost that chip that was important to car manufacturing. As we see greater impacts, uh, impacts to the global supply chain, which affect the bottom line, I anticipate that our private sector will become more involved in demanding more from their government as well as themselves to make sure that they are resilient going forward. I also, over time, have come to believe that uh, in a competitive market, there's a lot more happening in the private sector than we may be, for those of us in government, uh, have knowledge. It's a competitive environment, uh, so you may not be uh, sharing. I am told confidentially that's occurring. I don't have the proof, uh, but there may be more efforts uh, for people who do want to protect their bottom line and their profitability uh, to protect themselves. And I'll just say, add this last uh, uh, point. It is um, remarkable to me, uh, one of the challenges we have is that 
many people still have not uh, had, and I don't want to, had that aha moment. They have not connected the risk to what is occurring. Uh, and that is not so true among young people. Uh, our education system in the United States is doing a much better job of exposing our uh, younger people to what is at stake with climate change. When you're um, dealing with people my age, uh, it's hit or miss as to whether they've had any education on climate or not. And as you all know, there can be some barriers to understanding what it will mean and figuring out what the interconnectedness looks like. It takes some study. So uh, we don't have as large a cadre of senior decision and policymakers deeply invested in this issue. That's unfortunate because, as many in this room know, we're running very short on time. So I just I want to push you a little bit on that point. You, I, I know that when I engage in my conversations with friends and, and family members, um, I, I know that as Americans, many of them are aware of the risks, but they're willing to put themselves in harm's way. And this is something that, that is almost, I wouldn't say it's uniquely American, but I certainly see it very prevalent among us in, in our society. And I wonder, is this something you've thought about? I, I know earlier you were mentioning to me you had hoped that the public would have a sense of risk and how we deal with risk. Why are, why are we as Americans so willing to put ourselves in harm's way? Is it because we feel that there will be response mechanisms? Is this because we are, are a wealthy country and we feel that the, the government will step in to help us? Is it because we're really blind to the risk, we're not understanding the risk? What do you think? Well, first of all, I think uh, we are not alone in our difficulty in assessing risk. Um, Richard Thaler, a uh, economist at the University of Chicago, just last week won the Nobel Prize for Economics for his work on behavioral uh, economics, which is where you, um, you know, when I was in law school and we were studying contracts, they uh, were applying a, sort of a rational economics theory. Everything, every choice everyone made was rational. Of course, Richard Thaler and others have exposed that our decision making is quite irrational. Uh, so I think there's a lot more work that we need to do to figure out how to address our optimism bias. We assume it's not going to happen to us. Uh, it's amazing how many people you can find investing in coastal resilience who understand theoretically that their sea level rise, but they just don't think it's going to affect them. That's optimism bias. Recency bias uh, is that if it hasn't happened to me personally recently, it doesn't really matter. It, it's not going to happen. So we have a number of things there. But also uniquely to the United States, particularly in the last um, several de decades, the federal government has assumed a greater and greater share in paying for the recovery from these events. And that does, I believe, send a message to folks that they need not prepare, that the federal government will actually be there and help them out. Uh, we also have a federal insurance program that's sponsored by our federal government. Uh, it does not, uh, in many instances, require actuarially sound premiums. So the premiums reflect a lower risk than actually the property is carrying. We also have, uh, in many instances, even though the property has repeatedly flooded, we give them a, a new insurance policy. So we have these signals that we're sending uh, to Americans uh, that it's safe. There is pressure to change that. There are a number of proposals, particularly in light of these hurricanes, to alter our federal insurance program for flood. It's long overdue. The problem is uh, it's a political issue, and there are many uh, constituents who live in coastal states who don't want to pay the kind of premium that would be required if you are truly going to reflect the sea level rise that they're already facing and will face in the future. So um, there are policies at play, but I also just think it's uh, human nature. And um, the longer I'm in this field, the more 
uh, I believe we need to pay attention to that because it's a huge hurdle to get folks to engage. Um, I'll just tell a small vignette. I was re meeting with some emergency managers from Boston, and I talked to them about sea level rise. And they're, oh, yeah, yeah, sea level rise is really a big problem. So then as we're chatting, it turns out that most of them had been in the area a long time, and their families had beach houses in Cape Cod. And uh, I said, so are you guys doing anything about the sea level rise to your homes? No, that doesn't apply to me. There's no risk. Uh, and that's something I see. Uh, it's, it's theoretically it's going to happen, but when you talk about that beloved home where my family has gathered perhaps for two or three generations, it won't happen to me, and I'm not ready to do anything to address it. How we get around that, I, I think that would be an excellent uh, area of study for this group because it's a common problem. Thank you. Yes, please, up front here. Thank you very much for your fantastic talk. Uh, my name's Emily Boyd, uh, director of the Lund University Center for Sustainability. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about the sort of times that we're living in, and I just wanted to hear your views on this. Um, it seems that we're living in a time of extremes, um, socially, politically, environmentally. And I wonder if um, this has the potential to raise particular narratives around crisis or around fears of the future as a sort of uh, juxtaposition to looking at risk and trying to handle risks in the future. And I also wonder if, we, um, if there's a concern there that we maybe get locked into these narratives to some extent and they are perhaps counteractive to some of the collective wisdoms that you talk about. And I wondered um, uh, two things. One is, are these narratives um, prominent within government that you've been part of, in a sense? Is this something that is discussed and taken seriously? Um, and to what extent is it linked to the interconnectedness that you talk about? So that the interconnectedness is leading to a sort of rigidity we get stuck in certain narratives, or can we use that interconnectedness somehow to get out, to break those potential lock-ins? Great, thank you. Yes, we'll take some more questions here. This gentleman right here. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Simmons, I'm with a UK um, NGO called the Ecological Sequestration Trust, which rolls off the tongue. Um, I think you referenced um, the work of MPCC, the New York City Panel on Climate Change, um, and saying that, that, that one of the exceptions was um, New York City in developing um, resiliency design guidelines, and I think that's what you were referring to, that they're really the only ones in the country that, that, are, that are working on this now. Um, well, I just want to correct. There could be others, San Francisco. There are other examples, but well, they're probably I, the most I visibly is, yeah. e yes. good example. Yes. San Francisco. Yeah. Um, and New, York, uh, and New York City, and then the Port Authority, I think, are, are mm -hmm. really the three in the country. But um, so, as I understand, so Michael Bloomberg convened the MPCC, the New York City Panel on Climate Change, I think about 2008, and then now, so it's an independent um, panel of, of climate scientists that advise the, you know, the, new, the renamed uh, uh, Office of Long-Term Planning, but New York Office of Resiliency. Um, to develop what are these resiliency design guidelines going down at the parcel level that all new um, municipal projects have to pass through to have, as you're saying, more of a science-informed um, risk um, variance um, rather than something that's extremely vague um, on, with forward-looking data. So that's just the background, but I'm just wondering, like, um, how can we have more of these science panels in our cities to, to do that sort of thing? Because it seems um, urgent, right? But, but, um, but thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yes, gentlemen, the back at the side there, and then to the back. Uh, my name is Trey Taylor. My company is Verdant Power. We're a marine renewable energy company that survived uh, Superstorm Sandy in New York, where our project is operating. So, a couple of vignettes to share with you. The Nature Conservancy recently teamed up with BlackRock, and, and in that alliance, uh, the Nature Conservancy wants to take renewable energy approach to conservation. And then the other event that I want to share with you happened just last week when Senator Lindsey Graham addressed a group of us during Clean Energy Week. And he's a Republican from a coastal state. 
and these are his exact words. He said, in order to combat climate change, we need to put a tax on fossil fuels, use that money to um, uh, foster innovation and entrepreneurs to create market solutions to addressing climate change. So given that kind of spirit and conversation, my question is this. Might there be a paradigm shift from a public-private partnership to private-public partnerships? Let business entrepreneurs, private sector take the lead to be supported by government because we all know governments can't lead. Great, thank you. And the gentleman at the back. Good afternoon, I'm Abby Florano from the University of the Philippines. I'd like to follow up your talk about continuity planning because I've known for a fact that the Department of Homeland Security has a detailed implementation plan for government continuity planning. I'm following it up because um, I'm trying to sell it also in my country and I call it public service continuity planning. So my question to you is, um, are you still implementing that uh, continuity planning of the Department of Homeland Security and how far have you gone into implementing it? Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So we, we'll uh, do another round. So Alice, uh, looking at uh, sort of getting into this narrative about crisis and fear of the future, how do you see that playing out uh, in the government sector and how does that link to what you, uh, the points you raised on interconnectedness, uh, the role of science panels, do you see that being able to be replicated and expanded? Do we move to a model of private public partnerships and this um, public service continuity planning, um, DHS, do you know what's happening with that now? Sure. Uh, well, let me start with fear. Um, fear still plays a dominant role uh, in government, and I speak, uh, say that because I spent uh, four and a half years at the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security was born out of the events of 9-11. It is truly uh, must be focused on anti-terrorism. But it also has a huge emergency management mission uh, in the Coast Guard, as I've referenced, and an immigration mission. I think that uh, one of the difficulties we have is maybe the recency bias from uh, terrorist events that preclude us from properly analyzing how many, if we're talking about risk of death, uh, how many deaths will occur as a result of these extreme weather events, be they heat events or what have you. So fear is a motivator and uh, is, can be a strong narrative uh, for all of us. Um, I don't know if it can be, uh, it has, in my experience, not been acted as in that manner on climate change. And that may be because climate change, uh, again, for the human mind, is such a large amorphous change. It's permanent, and one can feel quite helpless in the face of it. So that, I think, for us to, you raised interconnectedness. It can either be that we're vulnerable because we're interconnected, but we can also find our strength. So this, uh, we previously were talking about community and some of the things that people can do. It's the individual. Uh, for me, one of the um, untapped areas here is finding better ways for communities to uh, use the threats posed to build resilience and really a stronger social fabric as a result. We know that the communities that have done that survive better in these events. Simply knowing your neighbor increases your likelihood of your survival. Uh, so if we, and if we had communities uh, uh, a sense that you're preparing yourself and your elderly neighbor next door with extra supplies. We don't have that culture right now, perhaps because we have the assumption that the federal government, somehow we have built up a uh, presumption the federal government will save us. Uh, we need to work on that. Um, we um, talked about uh, science panels. Uh, I think um, 
in all of this, uh, we need um, leadership. Uh, that seems to me the uh, uh, critical uh, thing that we need to um, make sure that we are emphasizing uh, that uh, we are um, going to do uh, the right thing um, and make the hard choices. So you have some cities that have been willing to stand up to do that, um, but it's a matter of political will and uh, it's a matter of political leadership. One of the things that's been shared with me, and it has been true in my experience, is that generally it's political leaders who are not looking for their second term that become, or you know, uh, have been in office for a long time that are willing to take on this issue uh, because it can be politically risky in the United States. Uh, and there are many immediate uh, challenges of education, crime, and other things. So the expression I've heard used is not in my turn, N-I-M-T. So we have uh, amazing instances, Jerry Brown in California, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, but uh, for an ordinary uh, mayor or governor in their his or her first term, it can be more challenging to take these on. Um, the question on private-public partnerships, uh, I do think the private sector, as I said, will step up. Uh, one of the challenges I've seen with public-private partnerships is what is the stream of revenue? And uh, in some of these instances, there is not an obvious stream of revenue. Uh, also, in some of these public-private partnerships, uh, the, because the public sector isn't as adept as the private sector, the public sector has ended up not with a particularly successful long-term partnership for the community because of the revenue stream. The private entity has gotten their revenue stream out. So I, I am not as sanguine as others that this will be the be-all solution. I just have seen a number of instances where uh, those partnerships have not worked out well. Um, in terms of increased cost to the communities than if you had had uh, more public funding. Uh, DHS, uh, with the continuity planning, I do not have uh, any particular insight in terms of this administration, but that is a base, basic function for DHS. They need to make sure that the government can withstand whatever impacts come. So they do do a lot of work in this area. Uh, and when I was there, I was very well prepared. Uh, I knew exactly where I was supposed to be and how to get hold of people and had extra tools to do that. I have no reason to believe that that's not continuing because that's a core function uh, for DHS to make sure that the government can operate in the face of uh, virtually any catastrophe. One thing that was raised here was sustainability, uh, which in my um, experience is typically equated with cutting emissions. Um, and it could be broader, but uh, sustainability versus resilience. And here's the challenge that I'll share with you that I think your group could, uh, and we all need to think about, is we have tremendous efforts in, in building sustainably, uh, in cutting our emissions. There's a lot of metrics for that. There are a lot of uh, standards out there for that. For resilience? Not very much. And we really haven't yet figured out to resolve the conflicts that are between building resiliently and building sustainably. So when we say building sustainably, for me, that does not mean that we will be able to withstand the impacts. There's something else that we need, and that's planning for flooding, planning for electrical outages, whatever it may be, that doesn't get captured in what I view as the nor more common usage of sustainability. And a lot more people are working on sustainability right now than, as you all probably know, well, at least in the United States, are working on resilience. But 2017 has given us quite a lesson on how much suffering this will impose and that we need to start figuring out how we will help 
individuals be more resilient, their communities be more resilient in the face of these impacts, and as well as the private sector so our economy can continue uh, to provide us strength uh, and be resilient. Wow. There's a lot for us to ponder. I'm going to ask you one <laughs> final sure. question as, as we wrap up. So, Alice, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you started your term with the Obama administration? What do you know now that you wish you knew when you started your, your service with the Obama administration? That this is all more about humans than it is about me telling you what the risk is or anyone else. Uh, that it's uh, finding ways for people to relate to this so that they care. Uh, that question that I told you we asked ourselves, should DHS care? We concluded we should care, but I haven't really successfully gotten to that next level of getting people to care enough so that they do something about it. I think I underestimated that challenge, and it's a challenge I keep going back to because um, for as many people as I speak to, it's hard for them to see the way they can help. And then I think as humans, they go, it's just too big. I just can't do anything about this. I'm going to go off and do my, you know, live my life. And, and I can't fault them. It's too, it is big. So how do I, I wish I'd known, and I don't know yet, uh, how to get more people engaged in this endeavor, which I feel is the endeavor of our time. There is no more serious threat than what a changing climate will bring to the world as we've known it. Well, Alice, uh, thank you. It was a really rich and engaging conversation. As, as I hear you talk about resilience, I hear certain key words that I know we have been discussing in the academy and here at the Wilson Center. You talk about uncertainty, interconnectedness, catastrophic risk, complexity, cascading effects. And I think that was a very important framing for us to think about what we can do moving forward. But I was really pleased that you also pointed a direction for us as we think about work that we do next. You provided a number of international examples that we in the United States can learn from. I think that was very important. We had a very good discussion about the narrative. What is the narrative that's out there? And how do we not get stymied by that? How do we understand and, and unravel that narrative so that we're able to move to action? I think you also made a very compelling case for things thinking of politics and policy making and the nuances in that, that environment, particularly with this, this phrase, not in my term, something for us to be very cognizant of, which we are not always fully cognizant of if we come at this just from a research, academic, a analytic uh, perspective. Uh, I also think very, very compelling your examples about the disconnect that we see in a personal behavior. Um, and, you know, we understand this on an, an, an intellectual level, but emotionally, how do we move to action and what does that mean for what we do individually? I think a very compelling call to action for members of the Resiliency Academy to be looking at the difference between resilience and sustainability and standards and what does that mean in terms of concrete application. Also, a very rich discussion about the public sector um, and engagement of the private sector and stream of revenue and the business case for investing in, in resilience. And then um, this sense of what happens at the federal level, but what happens also at the city and state level. What lessons are we learning from that now? And ultimately a challenge for us all um, as we think of our work on these questions around resiliency. Ultimately, how do we get people to care, but to care enough so that they take real action? Wow, thank you. This was amazing. Yeah, thank you. Please join me in thanking Alice. Thank you.
And once again, this event was webcast live. We will archive our discussion and we will produce a blog summary um, of our discussion today. So thank you very much for joining us. Keep tuned and remember to have a look at um, our work at newsecuritybeat.org. Thank you. <laughs>